Chapter 16 of the Migration of Birds by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Patterns of Migration Band recoveries, netting records, and personal observations help to determine migration routes and probe more deeply into the origin and evolution of these pathways not surprisingly certain deviations occur from the expected north and south movements in the previous section it was noted that some routes are not poleward at all but proceed in many directions after many years of gathering data a pattern emerges for a particular population species or group of species this section concerns some of the interesting or eccentric routes as cook referred to them that birds travel from breeding to wintering grounds and back again loops many species do not return north in the spring over the same route they used in the fall rather they fly a loop or ellipse cook considered food as the primary factor in determining the course birds took between winter and summer ranges he speculated that individuals returning by the same route and not finding sufficient food either did not return or did not breed only the individuals that took a different course with adequate resources survived and left progeny assuming that there were genetic components to this variation in orientation and navigation loop migration routes could evolve other investigators considered the prevailing winds to be the major selective factor since a following wind would require less expenditure of energy this would give an advantage to individuals who returned north on a different route if the prevailing winds were in more appropriate directions than along the path used during the southward flight whatever the ultimate cause loop migrations evolved separately in each species to satisfy its particular needs and this pattern occurs throughout the world among unrelated species the annual flight of adult american golden plovers illustrates the loop pattern in the fall the birds fattened on the rich crop of berries along the coasts of labrador and nova scotia depart south over the atlantic ocean to south america they stop briefly on the coast and then continue overland to the pampas of argentina where they remain from september to march when these golden plovers leave their winter quarters they cross northwestern south america and the gulf of mexico to reach north america mainland on the coasts of texas and louisiana thence they proceed slowly up the mississippi valley and by the early part of june they are again on their breeding grounds having performed a round trip journey in the form of an enormous ellipse with the minor axis about two thousand miles and the major axis eight thousand miles stretching from the arctic to the south temperate zone the older birds may be accompanied by some of the young but most of the immature birds leave their natal grounds later in summer after the adults and move southward through the interior of the country returning in spring over essentially the same course the oceanic route is therefore used chiefly by adult birds a return by the oceanic route in the spring could be fatal the maritime climate in the northeast results in foggy conditions along the coast and the frozen soil could offer scanty food resources for the weary travelers by traveling up the middle of the continent a much better food supply is assured other shore birds follow loop migration routes white rumped sandpipers fly from tundra breeding areas above the arctic circle eastward to the atlantic coast of labrador nova scotia and new brunswick from there they take the atlantic ocean route directly to the Suriname coast of south america then fly overland to winter in tierra del fuego they return to the arctic by a route through venezuela and the great plains 
as for the american golden plovers the interior route through the continent provides suitable resources while the atlantic coast is still in the grip of winter some western sandpipers instead of following most of their conspecifics southward along the pacific coast turn eastward at the fraser river moving beyond the rockies to migrate through the great plains then passing southeastward through florida and thence to northern south america in the spring they move westward to the pacific coast and the entire species follows the coast north to the tundra in alaska and eastern siberia several north american warblers including the connecticut warbler and the western race of the palm warbler follow circuitous migration routes the connecticut warbler is not observed on the east coast in spring but it is recorded further inland during that season thus this warbler proceeds down the east coast in the fall and up the interior of the continent in the spring similarly the western race of the palm warbler moves from its breeding grounds directly east over the appalachian mountains before turning south along the atlantic coast television tower kills in northern florida indicate the population is very concentrated here at this time of year in the spring this subspecies proceeds north through the interior the eastern race of the palm warbler also proceeds south along the coast in the fall but returns north in the spring along the same path scientists have hypothesized that the western population initially migrates eastward to join the rest of the species moving south along the coast because this flight path retraces its past history of range expansion an alternate hypothesis derived from radar observations however suggests that the disparity in seasonal flight directions of many migrants is a positive response to favorable wind directions at that time of year in the fall the short-tailed shearwater is observed off the west coast of north america as far south as california at this time the species is on the eastern leg of a tremendous figure eight around the pacific ocean the subalpine warbler and the red-backed shrike perform loop migrations between europe and africa both pass much further to the east in the spring than in the fall the arctic loon travels south across inland russia to southern europe but returns to its arctic breeding grounds via the gulf stream in the atlantic because this water is open while inland waterways are still frozen dog legs dog leg migration patterns are characterized by a prominent bend in the route studies have shown some of these indirect pathways connecting wintering and breeding areas are the result of tradition much like the lineage of crooked streets in boston which can be traced back to old cow paths when species have extended their range many species continue to follow the old route from the original range even if the new areas are not on the same axis as the older route the new extended routes are simply added to the old pathways this crooked traditional path can be seen in the routes taken by old world species extending their ranges into the new world from europe and asia for example the northern wheat ear has extended its range into greenland and labrador where the local breeding population has become a separate race when the labrador individuals depart from their breeding grounds they proceed north to greenland their ancestral home then east to europe and south to africa the traditional wintering area for all wheat ears alaskan breeding wheat ears migrate to africa in the opposite direction via asia where the alaskan population presumably originated alaskan breeding arctic and willow warblers and blue throats also migrate westward into siberia and then southward on the asiatic side of the pacific ocean
some investigators believe the arctic tern colonized the new world from europe because when this bird departs for the south it first crosses the atlantic to europe then moves down the eastern atlantic coast to africa and either back across the atlantic to south america or continues south down past south africa to get to south america from the eastern arctic it would be shorter to follow the american golden plover's flight path straight down the atlantic or along the east coast of the united states but the fact that no arctic terns have been observed in the caribbean indicates that they do not follow that route in western united states california gulls nest in various colonies around great salt lake and yellowstone park banding records indicate these populations winter along the california coast instead of traveling southwest by the shortest distance to the wintering grounds they proceed down the snake and columbia rivers and reach the coast around vancouver from there they proceed south along the coast to oregon and california in the spring the adults return over the same course rather than taking the shorter flight northeast in april across the deserts and mountains this route would be largely made over a cold and inhospitable country several dog leg patterns are apparent in the eastern and western populations of the tundra swan in the eastern population a sharp change in direction occurs at their major feeding and resting areas in north dakota after the birds arrive from the arctic breeding grounds they proceed east southeast to their wintering grounds on chesapeake bay in the western population thousands migrate from the alaskan breeding grounds to the large marshes along great salt lake then after a major stopover this population heads west over the mountains to california the general trend of migration in most northern populations of north american birds is along a northwest to southeast axis this again is a reflection of eastern species having extended their ranges by pushing westward for example in the stikeen river valley of northern british columbia and southwestern alaska the common nighthawk chipping sparrow rusty blackbird yellow warbler and american red start have established breeding populations in areas that are just twenty to one hundred miles from the pacific ocean the american robin northern flicker dark-eyed junco black pole warbler yellow rumped warbler and oven bird all common eastern species are also established as breeding birds in western alaska the oven bird has been detected on the lower yukon river and the sandhill crane pectoral sandpiper and gray cheek thrush have moved across the bering strait into siberia yet these birds continue to migrate through the eastern part of the continent instead of taking the shortest route south they retrace the direction of their westward expansion and move southward along the same avenues as their more eastern relatives the red-eyed vireo is primarily an inhabitant east of the great plains but an arm of its breeding range extends northwest to the pacific coast in british columbia it has been suggested that this range extension has taken place comparatively recently via deciduous woodland corridors and the invaders retrace in spring and fall the general route by which they originally entered the region in the case of the bobolink a new extension of the breeding range and a subsequent change in the migration of the species has taken place since the settlement by euro americans because the bobolink is a bird of damp meadows it was originally cut off from the western states by the intervening arid great plains but with the advent of irrigation and the bringing of large areas under cultivation small colonies of nesting bobolinks appeared at various western points 
now the species is established as a regular breeder in the great mountain parks and irrigated valleys of colorado and elsewhere almost to the pacific coast these western pioneers fly long distances east and west to join the western edge of the route followed by the bulk of the bobolinks that breed in the northern united states and southern canada pelagic wandering many of the pelagic birds observed off our coasts appear to be nomadic when they are not breeding these movements are not necessarily random because there is usually a seasonal shift in the population often for great distances and in specific directions away from the breeding area after completion of the nesting cycle also the return from the sea to nesting areas is at a definite time of year observations on the movements of pelagic birds are difficult at best and accurate records are few we do know some of these species have regular roots for instance arctic terns and specific patterns of migration for instance the loop in the short-tailed shearwater as more knowledge is accumulated on the nomadic species we may actually find they too have regular migration routes movements of some of the tube noses albatrosses fulmars shearwaters and storm petrels have been correlated with ocean currents prevailing winds temperature and water fertility commercial fishermen have long known ocean currents are very important factors in the supply of nutriments plankton and forage fish for larger fish these same foodstuffs often attract pelagic birds as evidenced by the tremendous concentrations of birds off the peruvian coasts where there is an upwelling of cold nutriment bearing water the migration routes of many albatrosses are over temperate marine waters of high biological productivity that of the lacen albatross is correlated with cold currents while the black-footed albatross occurs over warm currents many southern hemisphere pelagic species have been extremely successful by migrating across the equator to exploit rich northern waters during the north temperate summer leap frogging when two or more races of the same species occupy different breeding ranges on the same migratory axis the races breeding the furthest north often winter the furthest south thus a northern race leap frogs over the breeding and wintering range of the southern populations this has been well documented in the fox sparrow discussed previously and has been demonstrated for populations of the eastern bluebird vertical migration in order to find winter quarters furnishing suitable conditions many north american birds fly hundreds of miles across land and sea others however are able to reach satisfactory areas merely by moving down the sides of a mountain in such cases a few hundred feet of altitude corresponds to hundreds of miles of latitude these vertical or altitudinal migrations occur worldwide wherever there are large mountain ranges aristotle cited by dorst first mentions vertical migration birds in winter and in frosty weather come down to the plains for warmth and in summer migrate to the hills for coolness in the rocky mountain region vertical migrations are particularly notable chickadees rosy finches juncos pine grosbeaks williamson's sapsuckers and others nest at high altitudes and move down to the lower levels to spend the winter the dark-eyed juncos breeding in the great smoky mountains and northward to the blue ridge make a vertical migration but other members of the species breeding in the eastern north woods 
make an annual north-south migration of hundreds of miles the young of mountain breeding juncos work down to the lower levels as soon as the nesting season is over while the adults come later the sudden increases in numbers of birds in the foothills are particularly noticeable when cold spells with snow or frost occur at the higher altitudes in the dead sea area of the middle east some birds that breed in this extremely hot desert move up into the surrounding cooler hills during the winter the vertical migrations of some mountain dwelling gallinaceous birds for example mountain quail and blue grouse are quite interesting because the annual journey from breeding to wintering grounds is made on foot mountain quail make this downward trek quite early in the fall well before any snows can prevent them from reaching their goal blue grouse perform essentially the same journey in reverse during midwinter these birds can be found near timberline eating spruce buds protruding above the snow pre-migratory movements recent banding studies have demonstrated many migrants especially young of the year have a tendency to disperse after fledging these pre-migratory movements have also been called post-fledging dispersal reverse migration and post-breeding northward migration demonstration of this phenomenon is especially important as it relates to locality faithfulness philopatry range extension and gene flow between populations these movements cannot be considered as true migrations even though they are repeated annually by the species between breeding grounds and some other area since these movements are generally repeated by the same age class in the population but not the same individuals nevertheless these regular northward movements are quite striking especially in herons the young of some species commonly wander late in the summer and fall for several hundred miles north of the area in which they were hatched young little blue herons as well as great and snowy egrets are conspicuous in the east as far north as new england and in the mississippi valley to minnesota and michigan black crowned night herons banded in a large colony at Barnstable, Massachusetts, have been recaptured the same season northward to Maine and Quebec and westward to New York. In September, most of them return to the south. These movements have been noted in several other species as well. For example, the northward movement of bald eagles along the Atlantic coast Birds banded as nestlings in Florida have been retaken that summer, 1,500 miles away in Canada. Post-breeding northward movements are also shared by wood ducks, yellow-breasted chats, eastern bluebirds, and American white pelicans. A somewhat different type of post-breeding migration is the molt migration, exhibited by many species of waterfowl. These birds may travel considerable distances away from their nesting area to traditional molting sites where they spend a flightless period in eclipse plumage. At such times, they may move well into the breeding ranges of other geographic races of their species. These movements may be governed by the availability of food or a reduction in the chances for predation while they are flightless this is counteracted in the fall by migration that carries those birds from the more northern latitudes after the nesting period back to their normal wintering homes in the south vagrant migration the occasional great invasions beyond the limits of their normal range of certain birds especially species breeding in the far north are quite different from migration patterns discussed previously 
classic examples of such invasions in the eastern part of the country are the periodic flights of crossbills sometimes these migrations will extend well south into the southern states snowy owls are noted for periodic invasions that have been correlated with declines in lemmings a primary food source of northern predators the interval between these incursions varies from two to fourteen years but nearly half were at intervals of four years a great flight occurred in the winter of 1926-27 when more than 1,000 records were received from New England alone, but the largest on record was in 1945-46 when the Snowy Owl Committee of the American Ornithologists' Union received reports of 13,502 birds, of which 4,443 were reported killed it extended over the entire width of the continent from washington and british columbia to the atlantic coast and south to nebraska illinois indiana pennsylvania and maryland one was taken as far south as south carolina in the rocky mountain region flights of the beautiful bohemian waxwing are occasionally recorded the great invasion in the history of Colorado ornithology occurred in February 1917 when it was estimated that at least 10,000 were observed in Denver. The previous large occurrence of wax wings in Denver was in 1908. Likewise, evening grosbeaks illustrate similar wanderings. In addition to occasional trips south of their regular range, they will also travel east and west for considerable distances evening grosbeaks banded at salt st marie michigan have been recaptured in winter on cape cod massachusetts and in the following breeding season were back at the original banding location banding records and museum specimen identifications demonstrate that this east and west trip across the northeastern part of the country is sometimes made also by purple finches, red crossbills, and morning doves. End of chapter 16the mystery that formerly cloaked the periodic travels of birds for the writer of jeremiah has been partly dispelled through our discovering the extent and times of seasonal journeys of most species even though we understand more we still share with the ancients the awe and wonder as we contemplate these twice annual global movements indeed in some ways what we have learned only makes the phenomenon of migration more amazing but many gaps still remain in our knowledge some of which like the bi coordinate system that birds use to identify geographic positions have barely been explored other hypotheses like the use of olfactory cues for orientation need further verification we study migration because we are curious that suffices as a rationalization for our efforts yet there are practical implications of what we discover clearly the regulation of hunting pressure on many game animals is dependent upon knowing the patterns and intensities of migratory movements the protection of non-game bird populations for which our society has recognized its responsibility must similarly rely upon understanding migration there are even direct economic aspects studies have indicated for example that local non-migratory populations of various blackbirds cause nearly all of the rice damage in southern states and that hordes from the north contribute very little to the losses 
in addition the transport of arbor viruses by long-distance migrants has direct implications for human health while the habitat requirements sought by migratory species on their breeding areas have been the focus of much research and some attention has also been paid to the habitat selection of these species on their winter ranges we are largely ignorant of the habitat requirements of these species during their migratory journeys to what extent are the migratory pathways described in this book a reflection of continental habitat patterns that provide the resources necessary at stop over sites used during migration is habitat selection during the migration based on the same criteria the species uses on the wintering range or the breeding range how important to the success of migrating passerines are the forested corridors along major river systems how important is the density and spatial distribution of wetlands in the migration of waders and waterfowl if important how large an area is required to sustain these species during the periods of passage the nature and extent of environmental modifications wrought by humans throughout the world are readily apparent and yet we have little understanding of how migrants are affected by changes in land use or habitat degradation extensive forests have been burned or cut away rolling prairies have been turned over by the plow and planted in monocultures of tame grasses and row crops natural landscapes continue to be obliterated by urban sprawl air pollutants carried by continent spanning winds rain acid depositions on fields mountains lakes and forests wetlands are drained or filled riparian vegetation is lost as rivers disappear under the intensive mining of ground water by irrigators in the arid west the once slow but now rapidly increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide methane and other greenhouse gases generated by human activities will alter global climates even if we cannot predict with assurance the directions these changes will take migratory pathways evolved over the eons in expectation of a moderately stable environment with sufficient food and cover along appropriate corridors that connected sustaining winter ranges with suitable breeding areas still the environment has always been changing except for catastrophic events that punctuated the history of life from time to time change occurred at gradual rates this rate of change was slow enough that the processes of evolution allowed bird populations to make compensatory modifications that ensured continued existence but human impacts on the environment generate rates of change that exceed many species abilities to adapt a wetland long used by shorebirds as a critical foraging site on their extended journey from south america to the arctic tundra is drained and cultivated during the short interval between spring and fall passages warblers return from the tropics to find clear-cut mountainsides with no other suitable habitat open for their use weedy fields that persisted in the floodplains of major rivers and offered cover and food for communities of wintering sparrows down from the north now greet their fall arrival with orderly rows of stubble or the asphalt and lawns of industrial parks we know that the birds cannot use these altered habitats but we do not know the consequences of these events on migrant populations if we decide that we must ameliorate the impacts of these changes we must first of all know the consequences of these changes not all species are negatively affected by our impact on the environment while warblers and thrushes breeding in forest interiors may decrease with increased forest fragmentation edge species will take advantage of the more open habitat and increase 
as towns form tree dominated islands across the great plains many eastern species like the baltimore oriole expanded their ranges westward feed grains sustain larger numbers of blackbirds than would not have naturally survived the stress of winter before the development of a large cattle feedlot industry dredge spoil offers dependable nesting sites for terns along the atlantic and gulf coasts airports in the northeast provide perennial grasslands for upland sandpipers that traditionally had to rely on limited larger patches on the coastal plain or the ephemeral meadows of forest succession yet the general trend of our effect on the environment is toward uniform sameness we have reduced the heterogeneity of the landscape this in turn reduces the richness of bird species we experience in our daily lives and since we as a species have thrived on the diversity in our environment our quality of life suffers the federal government of the united states has recognized its responsibility to migratory birds under these changing conditions enabling acts allow for carrying out migratory bird treaty obligations in cooperation with other countries and now most species have legal protection under regulations administered by the u s fish and wildlife service refuges have been established to foster migratory species environmental laws enacted during the latter half of the twentieth century have helped to retard and even thwart environmental degradation non-governmental organizations and state agencies have come to play an increasing role in the protection of migratory birds yet the effectiveness of conservation efforts is increased in the same measure that we the people become acquainted with migratory bird resource and interest ourselves personally in the well-being of the various species we are faced with a twofold challenge firstly our challenge is to develop an ethic that recognizes our stewardship of these resources and that motivates the economic and political choices we make so that we may balance our immediate needs against a sustainable quality of life for future generations and secondly we are challenged to gain the understanding that is necessary to implement the good stewardship we desire end of chapter 17 end of migration of birds by the u.s fish and wildlife service read for librivox by sue anderson